the rules committee meeting to order. This is our July uh, rules meeting. We're starting a little late, but had a really good uh, uh, report out of culture. And uh, sometimes, you know, that's probably a, a committee that runs a little bit longer uh, with some of those and give uh, Councillor Vasquez the, the credit for even establishing that committee. So, you know, there's a lot of information right now with, with our nation. So at this time, uh, uh, if you stand for invocation, we'll get our rules committee meeting to in order here. Hokito da Kalandi Hang, Kohisanale was a Lee Heli Savajo the Dasanigi, Skistella Hido has to do Zuk to me, don't honey God here, Savajo Zila Wea, Osta was Zilo Kohiga, Unatanai. Most gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for coming, for bringing us together as one to make the decisions of our tribe and our nation. We've always thank you for the freedom that our military people gives us to worship and take care of our government in the best way we know how. Guide and lead us in this meeting. In Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Well done. Roll call, Shelley. Yes, sir. Joe Berg. Ani. Kanan Duncan. Ani. Keith Austin. Here. Harley Buzzard. Here. Julia Coates. Here. Sean Crittenden. Here. Joe Deere. Here. Mike Dobbins. Rex Jordan. <coughs> Daryl Legg. Here. Wes Snowfire. Here. Dora Petskowski. Here. Mike Shambaugh, Here. Mary Bakershaw, Ani. E.O. Smith, Here. Janice Taylor, Here. Victoria Vasquez. We have a quorum. Thank you, Shelley. This time I entertain approval of the minutes. Got a motion and second on the minutes. All in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. All opposed, ayes have it. Reports, Marshal Shannon Buell. I think he's, he's with us today. Good morning. Uh, before I start on my packet this month, uh, let me clarify something that was brought up the last rules. First of all, I apologize for not being here. Uh, the first week I was gone to Denver for a hostage rescue recertification, and then I took a week at, for vacation afterwards. So um, sorry I was here, but Scott Craig was here uh, in my stead. Uh, something that was brought up to Scott in the last rules was a, a question about martial service weapon qualifications. So we've had nine officer-involved shootings uh, in the past 15 years. Of those nine officer-involved shootings, we have had zero bullets not hit exactly what the marshal was aiming at. So that is uh, not the norm for police in the United States. I chalk that up to the training that my officers have and the time they spend on the range. We spend approximately $250,000 a year just on ammunition costs, so we don't have those issues uh, that line up. Uh, I can't speak to other agencies that we're crossed with uh, and, and their weapons calls, if that makes sense. So I want to be very clear on that. Uh, the outstanding uh, information for this month is we've had 83 prisoner transports just this month. If you can imagine going to 13 jails throughout our 14 counties, uh, picking up one or two prisoners, getting them to court uh, for the court. It is pretty much taking up uh, a lion's share of the marshal's time. Between that and special operations, high-risk warrant services, chasing really, really bad men and women, uh, we've been busy, I'm afraid. Uh, we have six new hires leaving for FLETC. Uh, they're leaving next Sunday. So they're starting their three-month fun-filled trip to Artesian, New Mexico. <clears throat> uh, we just uh, got uh, one new hire in this uh, yesterday morning. He started yesterday. Uh, he's already been to Fletzi, so he won't have to go there. So he'll be starting within the next three weeks his four-month FTO process. Uh, we also have three other marshals uh, waiting backgrounds to try to get them on with us. I will tell you that uh, HR has been really uh, bending over backwards to get our marshals in, getting the backgrounds done, getting them hired. Uh, <clears throat> I know there's always talk about HR being slow, and, and in my case, I don't believe that to be the case. Uh, they, they work very hard over there at that office. Uh, they're, they're, the men and women in HR <clears throat> need to be accredited with a lot of stuff. They have a lot on their plate. They don't have enough uh, personnel, in my opinion, uh, to handle the job of this. Uh, but we have to do a special background for a marshal. It's called an adjudicated background. 
to be a deputy marshal, you have to be able to, to one, get a special law enforcement commission through the BIA, and also you have to maintain it. So every five years, there's an extensive background that has to be done. I literally just completed mine two weeks ago. So I'm on my second, uh, the, the next phase of the my SLEC is due in October. So the background actually started on me in January, and that's how long it takes to get the background done uh, and then get all the approvals for the BIA to have that done so I can get my renewal, my SLEC in September. And he times that times 41 officers uh, because that's what we have now with all the new hires that we're getting. So you need times that times 41 every five years. That is a substantial amount of paperwork and manpower it takes to uh, process those for the BIA. So with that being said, is there anything that I can answer? Yes, go ahead, Councilor Critton. Yeah, Marsh, just going to appreciate uh, you for always answering that phone. We had the discussion about the guy who got the ticket, and uh, he was confused. I was confused, and uh, you cleared that up, you know, and just just uh, always answering the phone. And thank you for thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chair. Yes, anybody else? No, uh, <clears throat> I guess the, the word of advice would be is with the accuracy that, that, that's displayed from our marshals and the training, don't be running from the marshals. <laughs> Put your hands up and say, can we talk this over? So, hey, we're, we're, we're proud of, of our marshal department. It's, uh, you know, I, I've seen firsthand where we've gone out with rescue. And, you know, years ago, uh, one of our council members' spouse lost their, uh, 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 you know, we were down to the White Mission. I know you remember that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've just trained in so many different categories there. Uh, well, here as a tribe, we've actually, we've taken the lead in, on, on a lot of ways in training, and, uh, and that's good. There's re really not too many places we can go to learn from another tribe because we are the leaders. We have to, we have to, you know, we've set the bar high, you know, real high, and I appreciate what you guys do. Thank you. Yes, Councillor Coates. Um, I know in the past they used to rank law enforcement agencies within the state, I think, or something. Are they still doing that? Uh, they, they really don't within tribes. Mm -hmm. uh, they still do for state agencies. Mm -hmm. uh, I can tell you the Bureau of Indian Affairs ranks uh, police agencies by how many officers per, per uh, citizen served. Yeah. So they do that, but as far as, as, far as quality, they don't. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I can tell you that the BIA, uh, we are number one in Indian country for the fewest officers per citizen. So yeah. it's not a good thing to be, but what we what we do do, uh, that's why we train a lot. And that's why I, I try to hire only the best because we do have fewer than any other tribal law enforcement entity in the U.S. But I, I truly believe that my marshals can do more with what we have than an agency three times our size. Yeah. Well, I was just asking because it has always been my understanding that, that our law enforcement was pretty high ranked in, within the, the, the state and was highly regarded by other law enforcement agencies in, within the area. In, in every situation on any diagram about law enforcement in Oklahoma, we try to at least double the requirements of the state. So yeah. the state requires 25 hours of CEUs, we require 40 or 50. So everything we try to do, and, and it, it, partly it goes to we want to protect our citizens. We want to protect our neighbors that uh, also reside within the reservation. But we want to make sure that we're good partners for our cross-stepped agencies uh, because I, I don't want to ever go to a cross-stepped agency and give them a poor outcome, if that makes sense. I want to be there for them mm -hmm. to be a good partner. The only way you can be a good partner is that you send quality people. Well, I'm sure I speak for everyone here when I say we're awfully proud of you all, so the well, marshal you. service. Thank you. Good good comments there. Yes, Councilor Critton. Just to follow up, Marshal. Now, I botched this explanation last month. I botched it. Boy, but listen to this. All right, so got stopped, and the officer come from the municipality with a marked-out price, 
you're Native American. And the guy was, hey, how come this is marked out? So you eloquently explain this like I didn't do last month. So we explain why. So we, we cover such a broad area of the Cherokee Nation, okay? Each municipality within the reservation has their own what we consider a bond schedule. So let's say speeding five miles and over you, let's say in Muldrow it's $50. I don't know what that specifically is. Let's say it's $50. In Tahlequah it's $60. In Vanita it's $65, whatever that. So there's no statewide bond schedule, if that makes sense. So for the tribe to be able to come and be the exact bond schedules like Civil PD or Muldrow, there's no way we can do that. So we had to do a specific bond schedule. So if you're Native American and you're stopped with a cross debt agency, instead of doing their local bond schedule, they will do the Cherokee Nation bond schedule. And in some cases, that bond is higher, and in some cases, that bond is lower. But we had to have one standard bond schedule for our entire reservation, which would cover everything from Tulsa, which has a really high bond schedule, to Maldro, which has a low bond schedule. So we had to, to get together with the AG's office and the courts to see what was an appropriate bond schedule for the 14 counties. So we had to look at it more globally than if I were just a police chief or a mayor or whatever of a city, I can figure that bond schedule. Uh, Still will, uh, is looking at changing their bond schedules to match ours. Some of the other municipalities are looking at changing their bond schedule to match ours. So someday we might have a one bond schedule for the 14, but that's not up to me. That's up to those uh, specific jurisdictions to be able to, to do that. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, you you were you were close. <laughs> All right, Councillor Buzzer. Uh, Marshall, I talked to you a little bit about this situation, but I'd like for you maybe to explain it a little bit more. This is kind of a this is a problem that I see that happened in my district. Uh, the lady had a uh, young person that was unruly. She called the local police. He went out to her house and said there really wasn't anything he could do. Uh, and I believe they're cross deputized with the marshals. So what, and I know we can't cover everything all the time. So is it not clear to the uh, police department that they're cross deputized with, that we are, mm -hmm. that they can handle those cases? Uh, I can't speak to the specific case that you're on because I don't know what officer from that agency was out there. I can tell you that every agency that we're crossed with, we've spoken to all of them about what they can and cannot do, and pretty much they can be worked just like marshals. What we found in some jurisdictions, however, the administration of that jurisdiction understands that, but the individual officer that might be out on the street might not understand that. Uh, Muskogee County is an example. They called me over and I lectured to them for about two and a half hours, all their officers on this is what Indian country is, this is what you can do with your cross step. And we, me and uh, uh, Sarah and Sandy Crosland have went around uh, the reservation. Anytime somebody asks, uh, we will always come. So if, if uh, you have a jurisdiction area that wants to learn about Indian country and what they can, can and cannot do, all they have to do is call, and we will plan it within the week to get up there to them. That's how important it is to us. But what we found is there's been a couple of officers throughout the reservation that just, they don't have that understanding. And uh, uh, this is transition for everybody. You know, before McGirt, uh, a, a local police officer knew exactly what he or she could do and how to do it to them. And they've done that for their whole career. And now all of a sudden there's all these big question marks. And what I've found over 20 years in law enforcement, police officers don't like question marks. It scares them, mainly because we're on the other end of getting sued, if, if that makes sense. So if there's a question mark out there, they generally would rather pull back and refrain from doing something than to cross that line accidentally and get into trouble. So I, I can't say that was the, the case in this case, but I would, I would bet a dollar, maybe not two dollars, but I'd probably bet a dollar that that might be the case, that individual officer that was out on the street probably didn't have a clear understanding of what he or she couldn't do. 
And I don't know. I guess it crossed my mind that they just didn't want to deal with it. But you know, I, I never. I don't know what he's thinking. But I think they've been in business for years and know what the sit, sit, uh, situation was. And then they're using McGirt now because they don't want to deal with the problem. Well, I, I never want to get in a public forum and assume that officers are doing something Machiavellian uh, with intent. I would never get up there and do that. If, if I find that there's a specific officer that is doing something with evil intent, uh, I immediately call that administrator at that agency and, and get that cleared up, if that makes sense. But I, I, I don't know enough yet to let you know if that was just a, an officer not knowing truly what he could do. You got to remember the Cherokee Nation has just recently started a juvenile program to work with juvenile defenders. Uh, this is the first time we have contracts uh, out of Craig County and Sac and Fox to hold juvenile offenders. Before we never really did this. So this is new to every, especially when you're dealing with juveniles, it's new for everybody. It's new for my marshals. Generally before McGirt, we didn't deal with a lot of juvenile offenders. Uh, the Fed court very rarely deals with juvenile offenders. One of my uh, big arson cases out of uh, out of Bell, I had three adult suspects and three juvenile suspects uh, that burned down a lady's house. Uh, I got to prosecute the three adults in federal court and nobody touched the juveniles because a fed court just wouldn't look at it. So this is new when we, when we were dealing with juveniles. Uh, I, I don't know whether to applaud her or, or hug her. Uh, my wife was selected by the AG's office to start up that program. I don't know why anybody would do that, but she said yes. And, and she works literally day and night. She's on the phone as much as I am uh, trying to get these contracts with juvenile facilities, trying to get these. Uh, we had one over the weekend, a 14-year-old man. A young man was involved in an armed robbery in Tulsa, and the clerk shot him. Uh, he was shot in the shoulder. He was at the hospital still, uh, and we're trying to find a bed for him once he gets released from the hospital to go into detention. So th this is a, a rapidly evolving situation when we're dealing with our juveniles, uh, mainly because we want to find good facilities. Uh, with, with juveniles, we, we don't like just to house them in a room. Uh, it is our hope that we can get these juveniles rehabbed and to become good members of, of our society. So we're trying to find good facilities. Uh, those facilities are not cheap. Uh, the Craig County facility is $130 a night, whether somebody stays in that bed or not. That's what we pay for two beds up there. So. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Anybody else? Good report, uh, Councilor Shambaugh. I think something that's uh, another explanation for that, and I don't agree with it, but there are some agencies that are still, and you know this, they're still relying on the Curtis Act. They're saying the Curtis Act um, is why they don't have to adhere to McGirt. Um, I think most of the agencies in our county, they're not going by that, but, you know, I know Tulsa was... You know, talking about it. I know there's one in, in Delaware County that, that's saying that, you know, because of the Curtis Act, they don't have to. Uh, I know we have a different stance as a Cherokee Nation against that. Uh, it, and that was brought up in the meeting, but it's never really come out what our stance is. I know we are against, we are against that, but uh, I guess up until there's litigation of some time or a lawsuit and that's brought forth against an agency who claims uh, you know, immunity because of the Curtis Act, I guess that's will be the factor that gets them to change uh, one way or the other, correct? Yes. Okay. Is that good? All right. Anybody else? Good report, Marshall. Thank you. Next, we have Office of the Attorney General, Sarah Hill, and I think she's here. She's a busy person, our Attorney General. Good morning. Good morning. Just to clarify the record, Patty Buell came to work for me because it's a great place to work, the AG's office. I didn't have to bribe her. Um, she's a great asset. We're really glad that we have her. Um, it's been a relatively short time since our last Rules Committee meeting, so I have a slightly shorter report. Um, and I know you've been had a busy day already, so that's probably welcome. Um, 
at my last report, we had filed uh, about 1,100 new criminal cases. Today, that number exceeds uh, 1,265. So that's just in the last, I think it's been about 20 days since the last Rules Committee meeting. Um, we've received 147 referrals for juvenile offenses, up from 137 20 days ago. Um, and we filed 23 delinquent petitions. So it's been, we continue to be quite busy at the AG's office. Um, we have been also continuing to push out the municipal MOAs. We just, you talked about this a little bit with, uh, with Marshall Buell, but we had the city of Vianne signing ceremony. Um, and since then, we've also picked up West Siloam, Watts, Westville, and Kansas. And I believe Muskogee has it on an upcoming city council agenda. So we're still continuing to get good interest from the municipalities on that. Um, there are some municipalities as, uh, as Councilman Shambaugh raised, that um, are under the mistaken belief that they have authority under the Curtis Act, that somehow the municipalities have, a, have authority that the state itself lacks. And it's, um, I don't think that it's going to be a winning legal argument for those municipalities. But the way it works is that there has to be a case that goes in front of a court. And to do that, you have to sort of let the facts develop on the ground. And we've been keeping a close eye, especially in Tulsa County, where there have already been some decisions on the Curtis Act, but we have to find the right case um, and the right individual to take that case up. So we're, we are carefully watching that situation. Um, as an update on the Court of Criminal Appeals, there's not a lot going on at the Court of Criminal Appeals. The court did accept the two amicus briefs that we filed. They, uh, we filed one jointly with the Muscogee Nation and one jointly with the Choctaw, Chickasaw, and Muscogee Nations. And they, they did accept those amicus briefs. So now we just have to wait for the Court of Criminal Appeals to rule on some of those issues. Um, I wanted to talk for a minute about the Bossy case. Um, this is the Chickasaw Nation Reservation case, which the state of Oklahoma has indicated it intends to, it has, it has indicated it intends to ask for cert from the U.S. Supreme Court um, on a couple of different issues. But this was under the previous Attorney General, so we're not sure what issues that they're going to try to put in front of the the United States Supreme Court. But just as a matter of timeline, we expect that the cert. Uh, petition briefing will begin in early August is probably when that sort petition will be filed. And then, of course, there will be replies to that petition. Um, various groups will weigh in and tell the court, we think you should accept cert. We think you shouldn't accept cert. Um, and that will probably drag on through October. And then presumably at some point after the 1st of October, the court will determine whether or not it's going to accept cert. If the court does accept cert, then there will be a briefing on the merits then they'll, have to, they'll, they'll write legal briefs to the court saying you should, you should decide this way or you should decide this other way. That will go on through early January 2022, and then it will be set for oral argument sometime that next session. So somewhere between February and June of 2022, it'll be set for oral argument. And then sometime in July, you know, we probably, June or July of 2022, we'd probably get a decision in that case. So if the court, if it, if it went up on cert, now the court could just decide to deny cert in that case, in which case all of this, you know, dies in October of 2021. So we'll just have to wait and see. But I want to just let you know sort of what that timeline might look like um, moving forward on, on McGirt. And with that, I'll accept, uh, try to answer any questions that any of you may have. Yes, Councilor Taylor. Um, at the intertribal, they alluded that there had been some type of decision or some movement in the Brackeen case. Um, there was a decision in the Brackeen case. Um, they found it unconstitutional for one very specific area that had that didn't really have to do with the most important issues. Um, that I think they are there is that issue is likely to there's going to be a cert petition I think from the state on that because the state felt like, I mean, it was a split decision. It was a very messy decision all the way around. I mean, it was a decision from the entirety of the circuit. And then there, and there were, I don't know, there were multiple concurring decisions. They didn't have a good majority on any of it. So it was just sort of a mess. And so we'll see if the Supreme Court decides they want to take that mess and try to, to do something with it. They did find a very specific part of it unconstitutional, but they didn't touch the larger pieces of it that we think are the most important for ICWA. So I don't know. I don't know what the decision will be, what the state will appeal, and whether or not the state, the state's appeal, will determine. I think what the what the tribes may do. But we are in contact with our appellate counsel, our 
our outside counsel and all of that, and we're in constant contact with the other tribes. So there hasn't been, at least as far as I know, there hasn't been, I don't know what the, the what we're, they're going to file on that, what the state will file. They may decide we really like these facts and we want to take it up to the Supreme Court. They may decide this is such a messy decision, we don't want to get involved. Um, and we're just going to have to, I think we've just decided to adopt a sort of wait and see uh, what, what might happen on that. Good. <clears throat> Anybody else? Yes, Councilor Nofar. <clears throat> I had two questions. Uh, one is, is actually kind of a concern. Um, there is a case, and I, I'm sure it's not the only one, involving a, a female who was underage um, at the time of her state arrest conviction um, for drugs at high school. And it's a, it's a nasty case, but she was, I think, given something like 25 years or whatever. And um, I think there's been a McGirt challenge filed on it, but it's not being heard, and it's being held up in Delaware County, and it's no, no respondent to that. Uh, I guess my concern is, though we want to keep the right criminals behind bars, there's also a chance that, um, you know, courts get things wrong because we're humans. Courts aren't perfect. They are merely just us. They're humans. Uh, they represent us as a body. If they get something wrong and they have someone in there that could be held that's, that, that may need a second opportunity in life. Uh, is there anything that the uh, Attorney General's office could offer up or, or these attorneys that I guess are trying to work these cases and seeing it as a problem of not getting one of our citizens, one of our females, possibly more of them considering there's such a large female incarceration rate in Oklahoma, help at, at getting the state to respond to those cases? So that would be the, in the realm of the defense counsel for the individual. So the attorney general's office cannot represent defendants. We can't spend money to represent defend, any criminal defendant. It's a constitutional issue for the AG's office. So we, we don't get involved in criminal defense cases um, on behalf of individual defendants. Now, it may be that the case is held up in the Delaware County. They may not be moving on it very quickly, and that's you know, in the there, there are several cases where I've seen that where people, you know, who've had the exact same crime or very similar crimes on very similar days. One of the cases has been decided, and one of them is still sitting awaiting hearing. But the court has to deal with its docket eventually. And if there's been a McGirt filed motion, they're going to have to hear it eventually. There's not anything that I can do to speed that process along. The state courts that are not answerable to me, um, so they'll continue to move that along. But the defense counsel certainly can continue to say, you know, once that motion is filed, they they can to keep pressure on the court to get a decision on that. Okay. All right. Um, perfect. All right. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. <clears throat> Councilor Shaw. Sarah, the Supreme Court just recently ruled against ballot harvesting. Could you explain what that will mean to Cherokee Nation? Um, I'm not really familiar with that case. It's not something I've really followed, but the Supreme Court's decisions on ballot harvesting in a state wouldn't necessarily apply to the Cherokee Nation. You know, this body sets the laws, and so unless it violates the U.S. Constitution, it wouldn't be an issue, but I'm not super familiar with that. So it's something I'd have to look at and get back with you, at Councilwoman. Okay. And then uh, one other question. Uh, we've obviously got a huge influx of new cases. How old are the, our oldest cases that we're still, we still have... Uh, that we're trying. I guess it depends on what you mean by old in terms of when the crime occurred or when we received it or. I'm just wondering how many we have backlogged and what's the oldest. I mean, we have cases that we filed even previous to McGirt that are hanging around. So some of those cases would probably be considered the oldest cases that are being, are being set for jury trial. Um, you know, we receive cases, we're getting a mix of cases, so we get cases that, have, that are referred to us that are previous convictions that have been overturned, and then we get cases that are brand new offenses. So it really is a mix of, of different types of offenses, um, and we're not, we really don't have a backlog. I mean, we, we have a lot of cases coming in, and we're reviewing everything that we get, but I, I wouldn't, I, I, don't, I guess I'm not exactly sure how to answer that question. Maybe that, hopefully that answered some of it. Could you please tell me what is the most money we have ever spent on uh, prosecuting uh, uh, someone uh, in court? I, I, that's not something I could give you a number on because that would have to do with the number of hours that we've spent and uh, that our staff has spent on that. And 
I not, I, that's not, some, not a number that I carry around in my head. Can you give me a ballpark on what might be an average case? I, I cannot. I, I mean, are we talking 100,000, 200,000? I mean, no, not per case. I mean, some cases, it would very much depends on the offense. I would expect a, a serious case, a manslaughter case, is going to take a lot more time for us to review. To And if it goes all the way to jury trial, then that, expect, that those numbers get much higher because then we have to prepare exhibits and we have to that, and it takes longer. So going through the, the whole process of a jury trial can be, can be very costly. Most cases don't go to jury trial. Most cases, there's a plea bargain. If it's something that's relatively, the evidence is rock solid, the defendant uh, knows he's guilty or she's guilty, they may take a plea offer and then it's wrapped up relatively quickly and then they, they go to, to, to detention. So it just depends on the facts of the case and, and, and how long that process is. Sarah, one other question. This is approximately, what, 120, 25,000 in jurisdiction Cherokees, right? That's right. I uh, actually might be a little higher than that. I'm not sure. A little bit. Okay. And out of that, do you really believe that with 1,265 defendants that we can actually set neutral juries? Yeah, I think we can. I mean, who's related to who and who knows who and where are they working and who are they working with, et cetera, et cetera. Do you think that that jury pool is large enough? Yeah, I, I think that that is a, a large enough jury pool. Um, and not, not in every case we... Um, you know, and typically like in a county, so they'll call in a county court, they'll call from the county, you know, the number of, you know, the people from inside that county. So the county courts do this all the time. Um, there are lots of counties that, you know, the populations are relatively small and they still manage to seat neutral juries. And that's why you have the voir dire process where you can ask, are you related? You know, both the defendant and the prosecution can ask, are you, are you related to this person? Um, have you ever done business with them? And you can ask those questions and jurors can be dismissed if they have conflicts. Lots and lots of jurors can be dismissed if they have conflicts. So, yeah, I'm confident that we can, we can have you know, neutral and appropriate juries called for our cases. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> yes, Councillor Shambo. I'm familiar with that case you're talking about, um, and it's in Delaware County, if you're, if that's the same case. But I know that in this court system, I've been contacted by numerous people, uh, Cherokees, who have had past convictions, and really the judges, um, they're continuing, continuing them until they get an attorney and until they get some paperwork filed. But I, I guarantee if, if, if somebody files a post-conviction relief due to McGirt, they will kick it. I mean, they're kicking everything. And I don't care really what it is unless it's a major crime. Um, that's not uh, what I could consider a major crime. But they would probably kick it if somebody would file a post-conviction relief on that for, for them because that's all they're waiting for. Because I know I've had several people come out and just say, you know, they've got um, second offense DUI felony, um, you know, and they couldn't have firearms. They couldn't have different things, and they're immediately kicked, and now they can have firearms. I mean, it's just crazy how this is, you know, swapped overnight, but uh, that's really uh, all they're waiting for is something to be filed, and they're, and they're just getting rid of them left and right. So or we're remanding them back to you if, if, they, if it's needed. So I know that's the way the system has been working there. Anybody else? Councilor Buzzer. Yes, uh, Sarah, last uh, meeting we talked about some FOIA request information, and I guess the question is today, if there is an extension on a FOIA request, and I remember the old FOIA uh, act that we passed, I believe it to say 10-day extension. There's a 20-day period to get to FOIA, and then there's a 10-day extension if they need it. Uh, I guess my question is, how many times can they extend it by 10 days? Is it just 10 days and then they have to give an answer, or can they extend that 10 day two, three, four times? Um, it, the way that we've interpreted it and the way that it's been applied has been it has to be in writing. So that, so if there's a request for an extension, it has to be given in writing back to the individual. Yeah. So we've prioritized communication on that. There have been times when we've requested because it says that we can request a 10-day extension in writing. So there have been multiple 10-day extensions in certain, not routinely, but in certain circumstances where it's been difficult to track down information. Um, there have been multiple, okay, it's been 10 days. We're going to go ahead and put in writing. We need an additional 10-day extension. 
extension. Um, so that has happened on a few occasions. We, you know, I know that Gwen works really hard to communicate in writing with people so they yeah. know. And if they wanted to go to a court and say, hey, this, I feel like the law hasn't been followed, they would have something in writing from her to say this is, this is what we're requesting and this is where we're at in this process. So um, that's been the way we've interpreted it, is that we have to do it in writing, but it's not necessarily a single extension and then you're done, but okay. that there can be multiple extensions. So, so there can be, you saying yes, there can I think be multiple extensions. That, that is how we have applied it and interpreted it. If that wasn't the intent of the council, of course the council can update the law. If, if the court's reading of it is different than our reading of it, I'm sure the court won't hesitate to let us know, but we've really tried to prioritize, and I know that Gwen has prioritized um, communication with the individual so that no one feels like I'm just being I don't know what's going on and I don't know when I'm going to get it and I no one no one's telling me anything she's I think she's tried hard to communicate with the individual making the request so at least they know where it's at um, if, they, if they don't have it in a certain amount of time because sometimes sometimes it just takes longer than what maybe people would want and uh, but usually if we communicate well with them um, there haven't been a lot of issues with the process okay well, I think uh, this particular issue or person felt like that they were just being uh, put off by it. And at the end, you know, we we're talking about policies for the Cherokee Nation. And at the end, there wasn't any policy when it was quoted to him that there was policy. But when he asked for the FOIA to see the policy, it took like 70 days for them to get an answer that uh, there was no policy. So. Anyway, I'm sure that you'll be hearing more about this later on. So I just wanted to ask that question. Sure, and I think the, you know the AG's office on the in terms of the communication piece of it, you know that's sort of Gwen's that's Gwen's universe of communicating with the individual. The information they get and how how they feel about that information comes from the department that that it came from. So Gwen's not always in a good position to answer questions about the why of it, but she is, she, I think she does try to communicate about the process of sure. it. And, and, and I know Gwen is just doing what the job she's supposed to do and she's done it really well. It's just a matter of fact of not putting a policy out and not being able to produce the policy. Yeah. That's and I, the question. I, I think that's probably a question for the department. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Anybody else? Yes. Councilor No Fire. Just to follow up, uh, on, on what uh, Shannon Buell has said about his wife, Patty, working in your office. Uh, so she reports to you, and, and so does her sister, Sandy, because she's the lead criminal or prosecutor, criminal prosecutor. Uh, is there some sort of separation of duties when it comes to uh, your office coordinating with law enforcement? Not super sure uh, what you mean. Well, by separation have, of duties. Separation well, you, of duties. Separation so. of duties. So you've got, um, you know, if you've got your lead um, prosecutor, criminal prosecutor, has to coordinate with, with the marshals, law enforcement, um, you know, she's related, or obviously she's sister now with someone that's working in your office, now who's married to our lead marshal. Is there some sort of separation of duties in order to keep them out of the investigation? Because what I fear is, you have a sheriff, you have the DA, and I don't know about the judge that could streamline a case. And someone, I'm not, I'm not accusing anyone, but I'm saying if someone felt that it was conspired to put them in jail and appeals out into federal court, that this is a kind of a, an incestual relationship between the sheriff that arrested me <clears throat> and the counsel that's prosecuting me. Uh, so it was no fair case for me. It's just one of those things, do we have a separation of duties policy to protect that and prevent that from happening? Well, um, I conspire with Shannon Buell every day to put people in jail. That's kind of the gig. Uh, the, the, the law enforcement officer and the AG's office, we well, are... it's not a we, funny matter. I'm, I'm talking about some, you're not related to Shannon, though. Right, but we're on the same side. Like, we, we are supposed to be, we are a prosecutor, you know, the law enforcement officers, and, you know, most of our cases don't come from the, the marshal's office, but some of them do. But the prosecutor's office and the AG's office, we work hand in hand to be sure that evidence is collected in a certain way, that that evidence can then be presented. So we all operate on the same side. Our job is to enforce the law. And so I, I work with the law enforcement office all the time. I think you would have a conflict 
um, if we were on opposite sides in a case, right, and then you have those relationships, that create that does create issues. But we are all on the same side, the marshal service, and Patty Buell runs our, our uh, the juvenile justice department, but she's not an attorney for the for the nation. She is a basically the person who oversees the department and helps with the placement of these juveniles in these different facilities and works with the families on those different facilities. And so she's not an attorney for the nation. His sister-in-law, Sandy Crossland, is an attorney for the nation. And there are a lot of other attorneys for the nation that prosecute these cases. But we already are on the same side with it, with the Marshal Service and evidence comes directly from them directly to us and we, we work together to prosecute criminals all the time so I don't see it as problematic okay all right appreciate it <clears throat> anybody else yes Councilor Buzzer uh, Sarah I forgot to ask this question a while ago but can, maybe you can walk me through this process uh, of how a citizen and I briefly talked about it with uh, Marshall Bill a while ago this lady has a I'll say juvenile, and she wants to file charges against him, but she has to do it through the Cherokee Nation Court. Does she file those charges in district court here at the Cherokee Nation, or where does she file the charges? Well, she can't file charges. Nobody can file a criminal charge except okay. for the and AG's office. To, well, uh, let, me, let me rephrase it then. She wants to turn him in to get something done about him. Right. Then she right. can report the crime to local law enforcement or to the Marshal Service. Okay, so she would actually go through the marshal service to start the process. Then. I mean, either one, either her local law enforcement. So if she's a, if she lives in J, she uh -huh. could go to the J police. They're cross stepped. They can investigate that criminal act, and then it, it will be referred to my office. If she she can call the marshal service and talk to them about, hey, there's this crime that's been committed, and I would I want it to be investigated. Okay. So any of the, our cross stepped agencies can do that investigation, and then they will bring it to us. Now, just because she wants to charge doesn't mean necessarily that it will be charged yes yes I understand. right um, but but that investigation can be done by any cross-stepped agency and all of the agencies in Cherokee Nation are cross-stepped okay all right that answers the question thank you sure Sarah you're a you do you do a good job I mean with all the cases 1200 cases and you and your staff <clears throat> outstanding job one quick question I won't keep you any longer we've got a you know long uh, agenda left is, is there anything left uh, pending with the UKB? I know you gave that report some time ago, and, I, and I've, uh, uh, I've forgotten what it was. Are, is, what, what's left pending with the UKB issue? Thank you for those kind words, Speaker. I appreciate it. Um, with the UKB, the, the issue with Bartow, Justice Bartow, is complete. That matter has been settled and dismissed by the UKB. The appeal has been dismissed, so that, that matter is concluded. Um, the remaining matter, there's a couple of matters that involve the UKB. One of them is the two-acre tract, so the gaming tract of land that the UKB wants to take into trust for gaming purposes. Mm -hmm. There was a decision against <clears throat> them in the Northern District of Oklahoma, and the judge said they couldn't take it into trust for gaming purposes. They have appealed that to the Tenth Circuit, and that is in mediation currently at the Tenth Circuit. So that's where that case is. Okay. There's no briefing scheduled or anything. The other case that involves the UKB has to do with the gaming compact. And it's not just the UKB, but Comanche, Ota, Missouri, Kailiji, and UKB had these compacts with the governor, which were declared to be by the Oklahoma Supreme Court to be null and void. And there is litigation that, that the nation and some other tribes have brought in the D.C. district to have those, basically to have the NIGC declare, the court declare that those compacts are null and void. Because even though the state Supreme Court declared them void, um, there are some people at these different tribes that are saying, well, even though the state Supreme Court says that they're not valid, we, we still think we can game under them because the NIGC approved them by taking no action. So we're we're trying to get that mess sorted out in the DC District Court. Okay. So those are the that's the, the quick update on those cases. <clears throat> They're very good. Thank you very much and thank you for the report. Okay, we're gonna let you go. Thank, thank you. you. All right, uh, Gwen Terrapin. <clears throat> if you guys remember some of you before Gwen came on board, we were behind on some of these FOIAs and, and uh, GRAs and, and her and her staff have done an outstanding job to get us current. We, Appreciate what she's done. All right, Gwen, you're up. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for those kind words. I appreciate it. Um, to date, we have 13 FOIA requests, no GRAs, and there's none that are outstanding at this time. And everything's been updated on the website, and you guys should have a copy of my report. 
Any questions for Gwen? Okay. You got off lightly this time. <laughs> Have <laughs> a good you. day. You too. Okay, uh, election commission, I think we were going to do uh, Marcus Fears online. Is that correct, Shelley? Okay, he's audio. Okay. Any I, questions? I'm here. Can you hear me okay, Speaker? <clears throat> yes, sir, we can hear you. Any questions for uh, our election commission? I think we have the report. Yes, Councillor Coates? Yes, you do. Hi. Um, Mr. Fears, I'm, I'm interested in the absentee ballot process since the... Um, since we have the option now to uh, witness it rather than have it notarized. And so I just have some questions about that. Um, it seemed that for the at-large, uh, in the general election at least, there was a very low return rate uh, from what it's been in past years. Can, do you have any, is there any kind of analysis of uh, why that might, might have been either uh, such a low return rate or uh, the rejection rate? Uh, of ballots that were submitted? Uh, no, I don't currently have any analysis on that. Um, you know, typically in our, I guess what you call a, mid, a midterm, we would have um, maybe, maybe less, um, but I don't have any analysis currently. I mean, we can definitely look into that. Um, we didn't, I don't think, run into a, a whole lot of issue with the, with the two options. Um, it was definitely uh, took some explaining uh, on what to do, um, uh, but for the most part, I think we we had everyone follow what they needed to do, um, and, and we you know and, and it kind of was like a, a learning curve for the for for us as well. Uh, but but I think everyone followed instructions very well, and, and I think it went okay. Uh, but as far as analysis, no, I don't have any now. That's something that, uh, if, if that's something you want us to look into, I'm, I'm sure we can. I, I think I'd be interested at least, in, and I know everybody's really busy right now because we do have runoffs going on, but maybe at the end, after the runoffs, if, if it might be possible to get at least some kind of a report of uh, maybe the percentage of ballots, absentee ballots that were rejected and what the reasons for the rejections were. Uh, just to okay. see well, if, if, you, that... if you wouldn't mind, I mean, it'd be good to, uh, if you might email email me or the commission on maybe some of the things that you would uh, that you're interested in, and mm -hmm. then after we get through these runoffs, um, we can we can look at that and get get back with you. Okay. Uh, on some of those numbers, yeah, uh, yeah, we've got runoffs starting uh, this Saturday, um, or not runoffs, sorry, the the early walk-in starting Saturday, and then Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday of next week. And the, uh, we would be uh, we could look into look into that. Okay, I appreciate that. Um, I have yep. has the election commission. I presume that, did they uh, go through some signature match training, or have they had that in the past? Or no, that is not something that the commission does. Uh, it, it's been determined previously that we're not uh, handwriting experts, um, and so. Um, we go off of, like, say, if it's a notary, then the notary is is our trusted source for identification, and then the witness as well, as long as they're providing uh, the proper identifications, the photo IDs, uh, like the like the law calls for. Uh, but as far as any kind of um, handwriting analysis, the, the election commission does not do that. Okay, I understand in the past with the notary why that wouldn't have been necessary, but I would think it's probably a good idea at this point when we're trying to, you know, using witnesses and then comparing the signature of the witness with the photo ID of the witness and the signature on that one. There are signature match trainings out there specifically for uh, election officials for this purpose, so I think it'd be a good idea for our election commission to have gone through that, but... Uh, maybe keep that in mind for the future. I know that you're not their boss, but <laughs> but just as a suggestion. Um, and then the last question I had was uh, how we, we get a pretty quick turnaround. I think you probably get a lot of absentee ballot requests that come in, you know, probably right up until midnight of the deadline and everything. And then uh, literally not even 48 hours later, there's a... Uh, um, a request list that is available for candidates. Um, what would you say the level of confidence is that everybody who has turned in a ballot request gets onto that list within the next 36 hours or so? Um, I would say that I'm pretty confident. Um, 
if we I answer every single email. Uh, you know, if you've you've been in a campaign and you've sent in an email that, um, then you know you'll get an email from me. Um, if it's not me and 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 I'm busy at the time, then one of the other staff will do that. Um, so I believe that that is. Uh, I'm I'm very confident that those anything that comes in there is is going to get answered uh, and, and processed. Uh, there we have uh, a couple people in the office that receive the faxes. So it's not just one person. So, and we have a checks and balances on, you know, everything that comes in. Um, if I'm, if you know, if someone were to miss miss an email or something like that, then the other one can say, hey, have we checked this? Um, so I'm pretty, I'm, I'm confident that everything that comes in um, gets gets uh, received, and you know, everything goes into. Um, into a basket, and we all pull from that same basket to process those. And so, you know, there's, you know, we don't have just stacks laying laying all over the place. Uh, and so, everything, whenever it comes in, is is stamped, entered, um, it is verified, and then it is processed, and then it is um, then then it's filed. So, I, I'm I'm confident that uh, anything that that we receive is is getting processed. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Are you good? You're welcome. Thank you for the question. <clears throat> okay. Councilor Shembaugh. Um, one thing in this last election, um, you know, in the work group committee, and I think me and you had a discussion about this, but, um, you know, we wanted that um, walk-in voting or early voting and absentees to end the Thursday before the Saturday election, which gives you all time to process uh, all the absentees and not get dumped on Saturday and have a billion absentees, you know, brought in at uh, 30 minutes before it's over. And that didn't happen uh, because I was under the assumption it was going to, but then when I called up there, the deadline was had been moved back to Saturday. And I know it had been discussed that that would make it easier for you guys to uh, – get your absentees taken care of and not have to rush and do it. Um, and I know the reason why, but is there, can we go back to that? I mean, it was suggested by this council that that's the way it should be. Um, is for this, maybe not this election, but the, the next major election, could it be done that way? I mean, wouldn't that make it easier on you and not, and not have to get absentees dumped on you 10 till 7? You know, three. Uh, yeah, I mean that's up to you know um, the council. That's up to the to your to the body there. Um, but we would uh, we would like to see that um, the if the absentee or the drop box cut off. I believe what you're referring to um, dropping absentees in the drop box cut off the same time that the early walk-in did. That would allow us to um, not only have the absentees processed earlier, or, or the bulk of them processed earlier, uh, but but allow uh, results to, to to come out quicker. Um, it just happened. It just so happened that uh, whenever the 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 new amendment uh, to Section 78 allowing the witness um, came in, that it just that wording at the very bottom uh, where that was changed to Thursday. And I'm not even sure, like you said, you weren't aware. I'm not sure uh, how many uh, were aware of that, but it just it just seemed it it reverted that back. And yeah, we I mean we you know that's up to you guys, but that'd be something that uh, we would enjoy uh, probably seeing. Uh, the other wording that you guys might want to look at would be uh, dropping off uh, the the dropping off at the at the at the post office as well, because uh, we we did experience. Um, some dropping at the post office, uh, and so we might want to look into that time also, on because on that Saturday, uh, no matter if we have the drop box uh, here cut off on Thursday, uh, drops could happen at the post office as well. Yeah, well that you know, but, I think we were all under the assumption that that's way the way it was going to be because that's the way we wanted it to be. Um, right. But on another note, um, another problem. And in, in the first time that I ran, it, it was a problem, too. And that's, you know, having that deadline uh, to get absentees in by 7 Saturday uh, or midnight. Mm -hmm. 
you know, you have up to midnight to get uh, them faxed in. So um, right. that doesn't work. It didn't work the first time, and because there was an influx of, of votes, the fax lines, you couldn't do it. So we were given like an extra till noon the next day to get those in in the first election. Well, this election, um, I lost 20 because, you know, we started an hour and a half early trying to fax them in, and we couldn't ever get through. So we tried different computers. It didn't matter. It was, it was busy. And by the time that those were delivered, it was after. And, you know, that getting absentees is not an easy thing, and, and that's a lot of work. And, and whenever you send them in and you, you can't even get um, through, through the fax line, I mean, and you even said that, you know, there was a, a large influx at the end. So um, I don't know yeah. what can be done about that, but if, if there is a large influx in the, in the future and, people, and a lot of people didn't get ballots in that, that could have got in. I mean, how do we fix that? Uh, I, I agree, and I, and I hear what you're saying, uh, saying Counselor. Um, it, is a, it is an issue, and uh, whenever you set a deadline, um, it seems like um, we, we get the biggest influx at the end of that deadline. And I, you know, I don't know what the answer is. I know that we have several um, I, I've taken several notes on some things that we're going to look into after this, and it, obviously it's going to be looking into it with, with the council as well. Um, but I, I really don't know what the, what the immediate answer is to that cutoff, because um, it seems if we were to back it up to 5 o'clock that day, then our our, our, our big drop is going to be at 5 o'clock. Uh, you know, and so we, it's something that we're going to have to look into um, as a commission and, and maybe also with, with the council on how's the best way to handle these, uh, these deadlines uh, because that's what we do get a, I mean, that's for me personally uh, on a deadline day, um, we, that's all we're doing is, is answering uh, emails and faxes. Um, one or two people can do can be doing that um, on on a particular day, all day, uh, and then even the next uh, the next following day, whenever whenever we come in, uh, just answering those emails and printing them, um, and faxes. So yeah, that is that is an issue that we need to uh, to figure out. Uh, I agree, but I don't know what the immediate answer is for it. Well, I, I think that anybody who who works them, you know, they know you've got. The people that you just can't find, or you—I mean—you have a hard time getting, and you work up to that last hour to try to get that those last ten or yeah. last five. I mean, and you'd never quit till till the end. But but then when you get lucky enough to get them, and you can't get them put in, that's really frustrating. I mean, it's it's. But I understand what you're saying, and yeah. and uh, yeah, that that needs to that bears some discussion for later on. Absolutely. All right. Thanks, sir. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you. <clears throat> you know. We've Thank been you. we've been making recommendations. I can remember back to the early '90s, and it hasn't been accomplished yet. This is not the first time that this has been brought up about absentee ballots. We, I mean, I remember council has always recommended uh, back in the '90s. Why do we not count the absentee ballots first? Have them tabulate so people will know. I mean, we've been talking. I know we've been since I've been on council back in the '90s. Uh, and it hasn't, I guess the legislation should take care of that. But uh, they've always been counted last. And that's the one should be counted first because that's what everyone spends half the night worrying about. And then you go to bed and in the middle of the night, sometimes you wake up the next day and you just roll the dice. Did I win or did I not? Well, it depends on the absentees. Count those first so you can see. The rest is kind of, you know, pretty standard there. And our Cherokees are, are, you know, historically, they procrastinate on absentee ballots. Uh, uh, they don't procrastinate when we say $2,000 stimulus now. A little bit of difference there. So, but, you know, I, I think we can work with the Election Commission and the Council and get this resolved. Because we have only been discussing the absentee ballots as long as I can remember. Here, at your, back in the Keeler days, Ross Swimmer days, Chad's day, Wilma, myself, Bill John Baker, so... Maybe somewhere in here we'll figure out how to count these absentee ballots first, have them posted, and make it much easier for us to know how we stand. Yes, Councilor Coates. Great. 
Thank you. I just have a couple of, um, I want to ask for a couple of clarifications because I'm a little bit confused at this point. Um, are we talking about people faxing in ballots or are we talking about people faxing in absentee ballot requests? Uh, Councillor um, Shamwell was referring to a conversation that we had about absentee ballot requests. Okay. That's because no it was ballots. kind of no <laughs> it was it was sort of being coupled with the conversation about absentee ballots being dumped on you know at the last minute. So I was unclear. And then the second yeah. thing is that I was uh, I was under the impression, and I may be remembering incorrectly, but that the cutoff of uh, for bringing in like boxes of absentee ballots. Uh, was on Thursday and that that was part of the law that we just passed. Is that correct or not? That's what I recall. Well, if you, if, well that was the law and then whenever the amended um, Section 78 came in that allowed the language for the witness, we submitted that to the to the AG's office and, and, and it even appeared to them that it essentially reverted the Thursday back to the Saturday. Hey, Julia, this is Tim Brown. Can I, mm -hmm. can I address that? Yeah, because I was completely unaware of that. Mm -hmm. Julia, I think most of us reason, were. Uh, uh, the legislation amending Section 78 was actually adopted before uh, in, uh, pursuant to, uh, I believe it was Legislative Act uh, 2320 or 23 or 2420 and then after we adopted the amendment uh, which was your amendment we adopted the uh, new language changing uh, those cutoff times which was the comprehensive bill and so this idea that it changed it back whenever it was actually adopted before uh, is is a misinterpretation of the law and I would add, I, I specifically talked to Harvey Chafin about this. I asked him to get a, a AG opinion. Uh, I have not seen an AG opinion. Uh, it should be in writing uh, for it to be an AG opinion. And I would ask that the council uh, request specifically an AG opinion because this is clearly a misinterpretation of the law. Uh, the law was changed pursuant to uh, legislative act. Uh, I believe it was 2220 which was uh, approved right after your, your, we did it specifically for that reason, was to allow yours to be approved mm -hmm. and you, your act did have the old language in it, but then we changed it in, in, the, in, the, in the subsequent act. So uh, I, I would ask that the council request an AG opinion to, to specifically address this issue uh, because of this misinterpretation of our laws. Because I think our, in, our clear intent out of the work group and what was passed by full council was that there was a Thursday cutoff for uh, absentee ballots other than those that are mailed in, right? But, but those that are walked in, um, that Thursday would be the cutoff. I think that was our clear intent. So, yeah. So that's why it was confusing to me that that was being allowed to continue to happen. Uh, after that Thursday date. I hadn't realized that because, you know, I'm not here to watch it happen, I guess, but yeah. We need to look at that opinion. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Tim. All right. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Tim. All right. Anybody else? All right. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you, Speaker. Thank uh, you, Council. Well, hold on. Hold on. Marcus, you still there? Yes. Oh, hey. What I was going to ask, um, well, one thing real quick was um, sure. uh, I think the other thing that, that Tim, I need to get with Tim on is, uh, and I spoke with Harvey Chafin about it, is that in our election law, it states that you have, um, you know, the election commission can set how many uh, watchers there are each precinct, but then it continues on to say that there are, uh, that there are six absentee watchers, uh, ab absentee declarations, um, uh, each day that those absentees are being declared. That means you'd have six watchers nominated with two uh, alternatives every single day the absentee declarations are happening. Currently, you guys aren't, aren't reading that law and are using it for just one, and there's only five days that you could do absentee declarations, so why would, you have the, why would we have put 
uh, six absentee watchers in there daily, whenever it mentioned daily. Um, so I don't know if uh, Harvey mentioned that maybe we have to get an attorney general's opinion on that as well. Um, but the but the big question I had for you uh, was what do we do we send the precinct um, uh, the people that work at the precincts we send them through an orientation and a training correct correct um, in our election law there there isn't any verification of ID or person that comes in to vote if a person comes in to vote and gives you a name John Smith and you look up and find a John Smith on there you're you're they're just giving them the ballot to go vote is that correct is that how they're currently doing it uh, so you pre you can present your voter ID you can present your um, state government issued photo ID and I, also the law requires prior knowledge as well so if the um, the official knows the person so uh, you actually can't yeah. So yeah, so that's that's the issue that I've had right there is because in some of the in, in this last election, some people walked in. And in fact, one notably uh, went out and was was very vocal about how she went in there and voted, and then without an ID, and then came back, didn't know any one of the workers, uh, then walked out the door, went to her car, and then said, "I wanted a voter sticker." So she walked back in to get her "I voted" sticker, and then asked her what was her name and who she, you know she there to vote. So she gave them the name Elizabeth Warren, which then they then looked in the book to see if there was an Elizabeth Warren on there. And they said, well, I don't know that you're, you're Elizabeth Warren. And she said, well, I'm not Elizabeth Warren. I actually just voted. But were you going to let me vote again if I gave you a different name? So there is this question there that someone could walk in as just a random off the street, not a citizen, and give a citizen's name, receive an absentee ballot, and then vote. Meaning, you got you have you know an influx of people that aren't Cherokee citizens voting in our election, and not even registered. They're just giving up the registered names. So I think that uh, you know Councilor Shamble had mentioned some concerns with the election commission too, and I think that. Um, we need to go back and look at our, our law and, and, and do another work group, election commission work group, to try to revise some of these issues that I think we're going to continually see happen. Yeah, absolutely. I wasn't aware of that. Um, that's something I can definitely bring to the commission um, on on that. Um, as far as the the watcher thing goes, uh, I agree. We would We would definitely like some clarification on that as well. Um, it does say that you would draw six absentee watchers and two alternate watchers made for each day that declarations are examined. Um, how, it, go, it does go on to say um, that there will be a random drawing of six names from the list and you will draw until six watchers and two alternates have been drawn. And so I can see is where there is, it needs clarification because it tells us to draw six names, but then there's also the words each day before that. So that is definitely something that we would like the work group to, to look into as well. Okay, appreciate it. Appreciate it, Speaker. Yes, sir. All right. Thank you, Councilor. Let's wrap this up here. All right, Councilor Shembaugh. All right, I just want to make it clear that, you know, what when I brought this up to you, um, I just want, I think we just want to make it easier on you. And, and we thought that doing it on Thursday would be easier. I don't think it had anything didn't affect the election any other way other than it made it rougher on you to uh, do the absentees at the last minute. That's all I'm saying. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Marcus. Good report. Tax Commission, Sharon Swepson. It's on now. I believe you have my report. I would just like to point out one item on the motor vehicles. We talked when I was here the last time. We had had a, a significant increase, and through the month of May, that's still growing. It's about a 32% increase over what it was last year. So they're still going. The tag offices are still very, very busy. <laughs> so, but I would try to address any questions that you might have. Any questions for our tax commission? Yes, Councilor Deer. I got a call yesterday that the Tulsa, the Catoosa office, 
was 258 minutes right after they logged in. And so I told them just drive to Adair and they were out in 25 minutes. I was, had, was very short staffed at the Catoosa office yesterday. Yeah. I actually had uh, one person there for a few hours. Yeah. I had two call in, one on leave and trying, and then I was short in Tahlequah. So we were very, very short staffed at Catoosa yesterday. And I did get another one that came in at noon and picked it up. So I think I had three there in the afternoon, but I only had one there for a while in the morning. So, yeah, yes. so sort of waiting on that next tag office. Yes. So we can get enough staff over there. And, and, and I'll say again, that is my most difficult area of getting staff there and retaining staff in that office. And I'm, I'm not sure why, but we have a pretty large turnover in that office. Yeah, I don't know why. There's a quick trip across the street. <laughs> no, that's it. Thank you. Uh -huh. All right. Anybody else? Okay. Good report, Sharon. Appreciate Thank you. you. Self-governance, Ashley Fox. She's been waiting patiently. Hello. How are you we self-governing? <laughs> Hello, if you guys have any questions, you have my report. Mm -hmm. Any questions for how to be self-governing around here? Yes, Councilor Deer, you need it. Hey, Ashley, I mean, now we've had a lot of events in the last two weeks, and I just want to say their youngsters that are working on these computers mm -hmm. are fast. Because at Greenwood, I don't know how many people went through there, and I think we were done in 45 minutes. I know there was like 250 cars. Wow. So I just make a suggestion we hire all those youngsters to take over IT so because <laughs> they're fast and they're really smart. They're really personable. Mm -hmm. But your staff, everything re went, went really good, Ashley, and I just want to say thank you and, you know, thank those guys. So They're excellent. Those are our, our summer youth employees, and they did a great job. Yeah, so we need to find them a full-time deal. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, anybody else? Good report, Ashley. Appreciate you. Thank you. Gaming Commission, Janice Purcell. <clears throat> She's ready. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I submitted my report, and I just want to point out that I include the information about OIGA that Speaker Bird had requested and also our schedule for our meetings. And everyone is welcome to attend the meeting either live or WebEx. Okay, appreciate that. Thank any, you. Any questions for Janice on Gaming Commission? Anybody going to NIGA? From, from Gaming Commission? Yes. Um, we're not traveling yet. Okay. We anticipate that everything is going to improve and the numbers are going to go down and then we can go to some of these trainings. Yeah. There's a regional summit on Thursday afternoon with uh, NIGC and it's a WebEx training. So we are partaking in the, in the things that are available. Okay. I just saw where Nevada, uh, where the res and NIGA is taking place is uh, one of the hot spots. Ooh. So you're doing good. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Good report. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. We're down to our human resources. Alana Castile, is she here today? Good morning. State Ms. Your Castile. Name. Uh, my name is Brenda Barnes with Human Resources. Ms. Castile is at an OESC hearing this okay. morning and I'm stepping in to answer any questions. She informed me the report has been submitted. Yes. And if you have questions, I'll probably take them back and ask for some answers. There you go. That's the way you handle it. <laughs> any questions for human resources today? Well, you guys are, are, are doing what you can with the number of employees that we have and making sure you do your background check. So you're doing a good job there. I mean, it's not an easy task. And you know, People are always wanting to get these expedited, these positions. And, you know, sometimes we do run over 60 days, a little bit, you know, faster. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to work for a, the number one tribe around, then you should be a little patient. It should take some time. Mm -hmm. And 
and, and, and wait, you know, patiently to get these good positions. So with that, if anyone doesn't have any questions, I say a good report, and thank you very much. I appreciate your kind words. Thank you, guys. Okay. All right. Old business, none pending. We have a uh, in new business, number one. Councilor Deere, you want to take that? This is a resolution supporting the Federal Indian Boarding School Initiative and encouraging similar efforts by Cherokee Nation. Put that in the form of motion. Got a motion and a second. Got a motion. I didn't hear a second. second. Got a second. Okay. All in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. All opposed. Uh, Councilor Duncan, you want to take number two? Yes, sir. This is an act amending Title 21 of the Cherokee Nation Code annotated and declaring an emergency. I put that in the form of a motion. You got a motion and a second. Any discussion? If not, all in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. All opposed. Councillor Shambaugh, you want to take number three? This is an act amending Title 57 of the Cherokee Nation Code annotated and declaring an emergency, and I put that in the form of a motion. Second. Got a motion and a second. No discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Number four, Councillor Nofire. Uh, yeah, Speaker, I'd like to table this and bring this back and discuss it with a few other councillors regarding it and work on it a little bit more. Okay. Motion to table. Any second? Any discussion? All in favor? Proceed five is saying aye. aye. Okay. On number five, selection of interim rules committee chair. <clears throat> we need to select the person that's going to be on the interim. This will only address the selection of the chair of the rules. At this time, I made a recommendation for Councillor Jordan, so I need a uh, motion if you would uh, entertain that. Second. Got a motion by Kane and Duncan. Second. Got a second. A discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. All opposed. What uh, Councillor Jordan's uh, responsibility will be, and he'll have the guidance of uh, our legislative uh, aide here, Shelley, uh, just to do the the interim, he'll do the interim, is the is select the chairman of the rules. Once that is over, he'll move over. Chairman of the rules, whoever that may be, will take the seat. So that's his role. Okay. Any announcements? You guys have done a good job today. All right. I need a motion to uh, adjourn. Aye,